Has this ever happened to you? You go to dinner somewhere. Yeah. You decide, yes, I'm going to throw down $25 for a steak. I'm going to do it tonight. I need it. It shows up, and then there's a wet, wooden-handled, dull, saw-bladed knife there for you to cut this beautiful and expensive cut of meat with. Jim, I won't do it. You can't make me do it. I won't have it. So I bring my own knife. I always make sure it's nice and sharp. I pull it out. I open it before the steak ever comes. I let people know. You don't have to bring me that nasty-looking knife. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. And I'm Jim Person, the knife newbie. (laughs) We've got a great show coming up for you today. We're going to do our pocket check in just a second, but our uh, special segments this week are the first tool and walk and talk. And this week we've got a I know you can't see it, but we've got a lot of knives here laid out in front of us, and we're going to be talking about the traditional slip joint folders. So that should, should be an interesting learning experience for me, Bob. But as uh, yeah. folks know, our first thing we do is our pocket check. So what's in your pocket today? Because I think folks know what's in mine. <laughs> so Jim's got his Victorinox Tinker, no doubt. Yep, an do. awesome knife, well-maintained, and serves him well. I today have this uh, Fox 599 Karambit. It is a weapony kind of knife. I was going to say it looks like a fighting knife. (laughs) It's for cutting sandwiches. Mm -hmm. And then in my front left pocket, I have this absolutely gorgeous Great Eastern Cutlery Unexcelled Northfield number 48. This is the improved trapper. It's got, uh, it's got the clip point main blade. And then it's got this Warncliffe blade, which is different from a spay blade on a traditional trapper. So I think that's why they call it improved. Hmm. But uh, as you can see, I have a beautiful patina working on the main blade because I cut my lunch with that. And I'm a sucker for a patina. A patina on carbon steel acts as a protectant against rust. Oh, okay. It's basically like not red rust. Gotcha. So it's it's a protectant. Okay. Anyway, the, the, the green pickle jig bone on this. Just gets my heart racing. Well, you mentioned um, the uh, the rust on knives. That was actually uh, something you discussed in uh, one of our uh, past episodes. I think it was the intro show, yes, Double sir. Zero, the, the, yes, in sir. the Maintenance Minute. Yeah, the carbon versus stainless, high yeah. carbon versus stainless yeah. steel. If, if uh, you know, I, I do knife making, and uh, frequently I'll use 1095 high carbon steel, and I always either force a patina on it to protect the steel or blue it. Hmm. Okay. So if you haven't, go back and listen to our intro show, Double Zero, and you'll hear that maintenance minute as well as some uh, other stuff. Again, coming up, uh, we've got the first tool, Walk and Talk, and our discussion of slip joint folders. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with a lesson in knife history on the first tool. In this segment, we can go anywhere and anytime in history to look at innovations in knives and their gorgeous and alluring cousins, swords, spears, axes, etc., But today we go back to 1964 and the advent of a locking folder. Buck did not invent the locking folder with the 110 folding hunter, but it did bring to market a locking folding knife strong enough, stout enough, to do more of the work of a fixed blade knife than ever before in a more portable folding package. The knife does have curb appeal with its elegant clip point blade, wood handles, and brass bolsters. It's also a boat anchor in your pocket. That's why most people carry the Buck 110 in a belt riding sheath. The style and function of the Buck 110 folding hunter became so sought after that many companies began to imitate the icon. So much so that knives produced after 1964 with all the styling cues became known generically as Buck knives. Though Buck continues to update the 110 with newer materials and modern design tweaks, the original Buck 110 will go down in modern knife history as a turning point and the birth of the modern folder. And that's this week's look at knife history with the first tool. And now back to the Knife Junkie podcast. You know, but I got to tell you, the first tool that was some, that was some great history. I wasn't a great history student in uh, in high school <laughs> or college, but interesting stuff there on the first well, tool. Thank you. Well, there's much more to learn about the Buck 110. As a matter of fact, the Buck 110 is going to resurface in our conversation uh, at okay. some point today. Okay. All right. So good stuff. And uh, you know, the first tool will be a, a regular segment. It won't be every week, but uh, it'll be a regular segment as will be uh, walk and talk, which will be coming up uh, later in the show. But today, our main show topic is the traditional slip joint folder. So being the knife newbie, for me, you've got to give me an explanation. What are we talking about when we say that? Okay. A slip joint knife is a knife that does not lock open. It stays open through the tension of a back spring, but there is no uh, locking mechanism to hold it open against forces exerted on the spine. 
uh, a lot of your what people call grandpa knives or old small pocket knives that you see, uh, those are slip joints. Your Victorinox that you carry around loyally, that is a slip joint knife. Hmm, okay. It it opens and kind of st- it stays open, but it doesn't lock open. Okay. So that for me, that's a good way to kind of remember the difference is, is mainly the locking mechanism. Exactly. So the slip joint refers to the mechanism, but part and parcel to the slip joint is a whole other aesthetic. On slip joint knives, people who collect slip joint knives mm. tend to really look for the cover materials. And in uh, modern, that's where, and that's where it shows like on the handle. Yes, the exactly. Of the knife. Okay. The, the the sides of a modern tactical folder are called scales, handle scales. But on a slip joint knife, they're called covers. Hmm. So when I say covers, that's what I'm referring to. And I have a selection in front of us uh, of case knives, Great Eastern cutlery. I have a I have the Benchmade proper, a buck, and uh, a couple of other knives. And and they feature a number of different mm-hmm. handle scales. Well, and, and actually, a couple of them look like what I would refer to as a grandpa knife because they look like a knife that my grandpa had. Which I guess it's the wood grain finish or stag grain finish or how, how would you right. describe that? Well, this is um, we're looking at my new GEC Lit Creek Boys knife because I'm obsessed with it. Right. But uh, this is called jigging. This pattern on this is bone. Okay. It's probably cow shin bone. And it's dyed using very special uh, recipes that different mm. companies have. Case and GEC both have magnificent uh, bone dyes. Mm-hmm. And then they go in and they make what's called jigging, and, and they scoop out little tiny portions with a chisel. Oh, okay, yeah. And, it gives uh, you that kind of worn look or that texture to it, I Yeah, guess. it gives you texture. When you're using this knife, say it gets wet, or you know, why you have gription on anything, just so it stays in your hand mm-hmm. when you're trying to use okay. it. Okay. But that's, that's actually a, a pretty knife. It's a good-looking knife. Why? Thank you. <laughs> I love it too. Justify your purchase. <laughs> Justify my. So over here, you know, some of these different covers. This is uh, Gabon ebony wood. This is an African wood. These are micarta. This is G10. What's what's micarta? Micarta is a material that's it's a composite material that's made from stacking canvas, linen, other kind of fabrics, or even paper, huh. and then impregnating it all and compressing it under high pressure with epoxy. So it comes out, and you work it the way you work wood. You know, so when I'm making a handle out of micarta or out of G10, which is a similar material, you work it the same way you would wood. Okay. You would wood, you know, (laughs) with files and sandpaper and all that kind of stuff. So this this one I'm looking at right now that I have in my hand, you said it was micarta. Mm -hmm. It's actually got a nice little pattern in it. So is that something that... That's the weave of the canvas you're seeing. So that's what comes naturally. Right, exactly, because it's just canvas. Layered, layered, and and the uh, interesting thing about micarta, why a lot of people like it, and you'll see it on a lot of outdoor camp knives, is that it seems to get grippier when wet, which is odd. Okay, which is useful. It, odd and useful, indeed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, another feature I just wanted to get to before yeah, before yeah. you uh, before I interrupted you. before you interrupt <laughs> me, which is my game, Jim. I'm the interrupter. Is a thing called walk and talk. And you know we have a segment on the show yeah. called Walk and Talk where you identify a knife from its sound. Coming up later. Coming up later. However, Walk and Talk comes from the traditional world. It's this sound and the pull action that the blade makes when it's coming open. This knife, the GEC-14, uh, has a half stop for safety. So if it's closing, it'll okay, only that's stop. That's what you mean by half stop. It stops halfway before closing. Exactly. Okay. There's a flattened portion of the tang that, that hits the spring and it stops it right there. And then it closes. Open, close. That's called walk and talk. And the sound comes from, if it's a good crisp sound and good crisp walk and talk, that means the action is good. Oh, okay. So uh, this, this is something that people who collect slip joint knives look oh, okay. for. Okay. So not only will I be able to walk the talk, but I'll be able to eat talk about walk and talk. And... <laughs> And you'll be able to whittle, Jim. You'll be able to make yourself a toothpick. Yeah, okay. I mean, well, these things were used for all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Well, let me ask you about that, the half stop, mm-hmm. uh, kind of a safety mechanism, because that's kind of one of the things I was looking at, because seeing these knives here versus the knives that we talked about in show number one, um, the modern tactical folder that had a kind of a, an automatic open, mm-hmm. these seemingly like could you could hurt yourself because they don't have a, a locking mechanism, if you will. Well, but even though that one had the half stop, as you call right? It. Essentially, that's true, Jim. But if you're using a slip joint knife in such a way that you're exerting pressure on the spine of the blade instead of the edge of the blade, you're using that knife wrong. Mm. It's incorrect to put pressure on the back of the knife. 
Now I'm being condescending and being a bit of a jerk, but I hear that argument a lot. And you know, the idea is there are certain things, certain tasks you're going to do with your knife that you want it locked open. Sure. I totally get that. So that's not what you use these slip joints for. You carry these little knives around to, um, for everyday carry tasks like opening letters, cutting cord. I use them a lot at lunchtime. The sharper it is, the better it opens the package. That's gratifying to me, Jim, right. believe it or not. And then I go to cut my meat and I'm always using the slip joint in my pocket for two reasons. It's always sharper than anything else I can get because right. I keep my knives sharp, people. And number two, I'm always trying to work on the patina of one of my high carbon steel blades. Oh, okay. And meat does a great job. Okay. As you so, can see. So when you go out to lunch or dinner and you use one of these uh, slip joints and you cut your meat, uh, I want to kind of talk maintenance for a minute to get that patina. Do you, do you wipe off the juice or, I mean, kind of talk to me. About okay. That so bit. what I do is I let the juice languish on the blade for as long as socially acceptable <laughs> at the restaurant. <laughs> they have this knife leg on the table. And then I do something that every time drives my wife absolutely nuts, but I, some things you just have to weather and I dunk it in my glass of water or in my glass of wine, swish it around and then wipe it off. You know, just to get it clean so it's not sitting in my pocket with, with oh, okay. chunks of whatever on gotcha. it, pork, okay. pork chop. But All right. uh, you ask about that, Jim, I have a dedicated steak knife that I carry with me every time we go out to dinner. And it's one of these great Eastern cutleries. It's it's called the Ben Hogan. I can't remember the number. It's like 65 or something. But it's a nice, long, beautiful knife with a mm. gorgeous, delicious patina. I say delicious because many a good meal were eaten with that knife. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. You know, that's, I, I would have never thought about having a dedicated <gasps> knife for that. Has this ever happened to you? You go to dinner somewhere. Yeah. You decide, yes, I'm going to throw down $25 for a steak. I'm going to do it tonight. I need it. It shows up, and then there's a wet, wooden-handled, dull, saw-bladed knife there for you to cut this beautiful and expensive cut of meat with. Jim, I won't do it. You can't make me do it. I won't have it. So I bring my own knife. I always make sure it's nice and sharp. I pull it out. I open it before the steak ever comes. I let people know. You don't have to bring me that nasty-looking knife, and they always do. Right. But anyway, so slip joint knives. Interesting. Okay. We talked about how they're used, kind of what are they. When we're talking about collectible, is this one of the categories of knives that's highly collectible, less collectible? Is it just as collectible as anything else? I mean, kind of put that into a range for me if you could. I would say that they are highly collectible hmm. in, in that when I think of a collector, especially a collector of knives, they are frequently looking at the same but different, just like Hollywood. The same but different. Give me the same but different. I want that paramilitary too, but I want it with 204P steel and I want it with a brown handle. It's the same thing with the slip joint world. I want that GEC 14 Lick Creek Boys Knife, but I also want it with the uh, Canvas Micarta handle. And mm -hmm. I also want it with the Red Burlwood handle or the Snakewood or whatever, oh, you know. Okay, yeah, that's that's why I was talking about the covers. That's what makes these so right. darn collectible. Okay. People go for the different covers. So that's that's good for knife makers because they've got the same pattern or, or cutout or whatever you will. They just have to change the cover and exactly. they've got a different product to sell. That is that is the um that's the bread and butter of case knives. The biggest uh probably the longest running continuous running and biggest manufacturer of slip joint knives, at least in, in the States. Mm. Every Christmas they come out with their Christmas line where they have the most their most famous patterns. Uh, slip joint knives come in patterns. Right. This is a trapper. It's a two-bladed knife. This is a jackknife. This is a sodbuster. They're all patterns. But every year they release those patterns with a new Christmas handle, you know, 2018 Christmas handle. Gotcha. And they're imminently collectible, endlessly collectible. Right. But also um, these Great Eastern Cutlery knives, these are made by a small company in Pennsylvania, Bradford, Pennsylvania, I believe. Uh, that bought 100-year-old machines that were made for making these knives 100 years ago oh, cool. and resuscitated the whole, basically resuscitated that whole industry. Right. What I mean is gave Case some competition. Interesting point. You talked about uh, the holidays, Christmas coming up, different patterns. We would love for you to call our listener line at 724-466-4487. Let us know who you are. Uh, if you've got a YouTube channel or a website or whatever, go ahead and plug that. We'll be glad to give you some uh, publicity. But let us know what type of knife you would like to receive as a Christmas gift. 
Uh, maybe you can uh, share it with your spouse or friend or somebody. But we'd kind of love to hear from our listeners about what their uh, their favorite knives are and what they're looking to get for uh, for a holiday present this year. So call the listener line at 724-466-4487. And, and pull no punches with this. Let's pretend budget is no issue. Let's pretend your uh, wife's not going to know how much this oh, knife okay. is going to cost. Okay. She's just going to blindly go out and get it for you. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, so and- we, we want to hear like... Wish list. Though. Yeah, well, and just make sure make it clear, we're not paying for these knives. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, one thing I noticed in the difference in these knives that we're seeing here in front of me today, and mm-hmm. again, uh, when you're, if you listen to this on the website, uh, we'll have some pictures, but the slip joint folders in differing to last week's show, show number one, where we're talking about the modern tactical folder, some of these knives have multiple blades. Yes, that's right. Uh, depending on the pattern, these traditional knives will have multiple blades for multiple functions. Um, this is a traditional American work knife called the Sod Buster. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Why is it called Sod Buster, by the way? I, you know, I'm not sure. Oh, okay. I'm not Buster's sure. a lot of sod. I yeah, guess. exactly. <laughs> it's for cutting sod, Jim. Yeah. I'm just going to make that up right now. Uh, and it's traditionally, it's always a, a one-bladed work mm, knife. Okay. And usually not, not expensive materials go into making that. Okay. But this is a... Uh, this is a GEC 14 or 44 in Gabon ebony wood. This is a jackknife. A jackknife is a is a, a multi-bladed knife that uh, in which all of the blades hinge on the same side. So this this is a traditional jackknife okay. with a pen blade and a clip point blade. Okay. This is called a stockman for presumably for horse people and it's or cow cowboys and it's got three blades on it. This one incidentally is called a spay blade. It's for neutering animals. On that little thing. This, yeah, this, well, this is a small spade blade. So this is for neutering squirrels. This one here is for, on this big case, that's for neutering bulls right there. Uh-huh. Bulls and squirrels. Uh-huh. Some, either, either one of which I'm not going to be doing. <laughs> Good for you, Jim. Okay. But so you mentioned jack blade. So yeah. when we say jack blade, that means that the blades all open on the same, same side, same hinge or same size. Same as well. And if it, if, as opposed to my Swiss Army knife. Correct. Now, I guess that's called a multi tool, but if you have a knife like, uh, well, I don't have it with me, like a canoe knife mm-hmm. has two blades, but they come from either side. A muskrat, okay. same thing. A moose, okay. same thing. Okay. They're multi blades. Yeah. Slip joints. Jack knives, different patterns, a lot to take in. Well, now here's a, another little element before we wrap up this conversation, is that these traditional knives don't preclude locking mechanisms altogether. Throughout throughout the 20th century, or early 20th century and 19th century, you'll find um, traditional knives that open up and have a, a sort of liner lock and that will keep it open. Or back locks started to become uh, in vogue. And this knife right here, um, this is the Buck 110. And you'll hear about this in the first tool. This is a, this is kind of the bridge knife between these slip joint folders and the modern tactical folder. It's called the Buck 110 Folding Hunter. It came out in 64 and revolutionized pocket knives. So much so that all these companies copied this. And uh, these knives generically became buck knives. If it looked like this, it had the brass bolters, bolsters, mm-hmm. the wood handle, this clip point oh, okay. blade. Okay. Just... So this was made for hunters so they didn't have to carry around their, their bigger knives if they had smaller tasks to do on the hunt. Turns out, uh, you know, it became a redneck tactical knife. You know, <laughs> guys would carry this for all sorts of things. Okay. And you'd see, you'd see the little black pouch on the belt. Before it was a phone, it was right. one of these buck 110 oh, okay. knives. So kind of the bridge. Because as you can see, it uses some of these natural materials. Yeah, that's a, that's that's actually a good looking knife. That's a I, w- I was going to say pretty knife, but I don't know if that's the right Always. terminology. But <laughs> yeah, I think pretty works. Too. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good sharp looking knife as opposed to the one here. That's uh, I think you said micarta handle. Yes. But yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, but um, it looks utilitarian. Yeah, yeah, but that 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 buck buck knife, I think you said. Yeah, yeah, that that's a sharp, especially with the gold kind of gold end caps, if you will. Mm. I think yeah. I know what I'm getting Jim for Christmas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of that, don't forget, call our listener line, 724-466-4487. Let us know what knife you would like to get for Christmas. Wrap it up, Bob, on our uh, traditional slip joint folders uh, segment here. Okay. What, do we, what do we need to know? What do we need to remember? Well, let me just say this. I know that these first podcasts are introductory to, to things, but soon enough, I will be referencing these as commonplace. For me, they have worked their way back into my everyday carry, and they're not going anywhere. For a while, I was a little vexed about how to carry them because I don't like how they ride sideways when they just flop around in the pocket. So I created a pocket slip for myself. You can buy them online. They're easy to make. And now, and, and, and when you 
put where the, when you keep the slip joints in those slips in your pocket, they don't rattle around. And now I carry them all the time. I'm not pulling out my Emerson Sachs uh, in front of my boss to open an envelope. I'm pulling out one of these classy little knives. Mm. Don't forget about your slip joints. It's time now for the Knife Junkies Walk and Talk segment, where you try to identify the knife by the sound it makes. Okay, in our inaugural edition of Walk and Talk, the segment of the show where you identify the knife by the sound it makes, we are pulling out this knife. What is this knife? There are different ways to open it. I'll open it mm, the most common way. And that's it closing. And now I'm going to open up. That's another way. That is yet another way. So that's a hint right there. Multiple ways to open this knife. So you, you pretty much know that it's something made after 1964. <laughs> All right. This has been Walk and Talk. So if you think you know what this knife is just from the sound of it, just from its walk and talk, call our listener line, 724-466-4487. Tell us what you think it is, and uh, you might hear yourself and your answer on the next show. That's walk and talk. Think you know what that knife was? Then call the 24-7 Knife Junkie listener line at 724-466-4487 or email the Knife Junkie at bob at thenifejunkie.com and let us know. All right, back on the Knife Junkie podcast, Jim, the newbie person here, the knife newbie, along with Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, uh, wrapping up, and Bob, a good discussion about uh, traditional slip joint folders. Kind of recap the the key points that we learned today. Well, uh, key points... Slip joints and traditional folders mostly are non-locking and used for light tasks. They are can be very collectible due to the many different materials and uh, blade configurations you can buy. And uh, I'd also like to say, slip joints are often people's first knives, whether it's a Victor- whether it's a Swiss Army knife or it's that old pocket knife they got from their grandfather. I would say find that old pocket knife that your grandfather gave you, clean it up with some steel wool and some oil, get it looking nice, and start using it. Your grandfather would love that. And be proud of you for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, again, this kind of is continuing our kind of Knives 101 discussion as we're going to have on the first several issues of the Knife Junkie podcast before we start delving into really more uh, more subject matters, uh, a lot of ex- uh, expert interviews coming up on the show, that kind of thing. So next week, uh, show number three, what can we look forward well, to? I think for show number three, we have to continue up Knives 101 with fixed blade knives, a discussion of camp knives and combat knives. Ooh. Yes. Sounds interesting. Interesting. Some cool examples to bring in. Okay, we'll have some pictures on the blog. So thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. Don't forget to follow us on thenifejunkie.com. For Bob, the Knife Junkie, DeMarco, uh, I'm Jim Person, the Knife Newbie, and we want to thank you for listening to the first uh, several issues or episodes of the Knife Junkie podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.